Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the holiday edition of the Weekly Top 3, our last segment this year. The Weekly Top 3 is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. Normally on the podcast, we talk about the top three issues currently facing state, fiscal, and oil and gas policymakers. But this week, on the holiday edition, Michael and I get in the spirit by talking about three holiday-themed topics. First, we talk about our favorite Christmas movies, including taking on the eternal question of whether Die Hard qualifies as one. Second, we talk about some of our favorite Christmas memories. Third, at Michael's urging, I go through a list of five of my favorite Celtic music artists. And now... Let's join Michael. It is our final show for the year, our final holiday, our final Tuesday, and the weekly top three with Brad Keithley, only it's not the weekly top three, it's the holiday top three, and uh, we're going to talk with Brad. Uh, Brad's got a whole list. That's going to be number three today, which is his top five Celtic music inspirations, the the, the, the bands and the, and the acts that... He just can't get enough of it. If you haven't been following Brad for a long time, you don't know that he is like the biggest Celtic music nerd in the world, Uh, aficionado. I mean, we call it nerd, but it's really aficionado. No, Uh, nerd's fine. Nerd's Nerd's fine. fine. And uh, but I'm going to I'm going to do a a top one and two for him here. So we're going to we're going to go back and revisit from yesterday. Brad, we had some top. Christmas movies and top Christmas memories, so we're going to start there. And uh, and yes, why are you not wearing your ugly Christmas sweater that I sent you? I'm sure it's... <laughs> you, know, you know, it just dawned on me that I, uh, that I that I should have been wearing my ugly Christmas sweater. I can go change. Yeah, but, no, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, so, Brad, you know, the, the Christmas time... What, 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 wardrobe malfunction. Yeah, it's a wardrobe malfunction, right? <laughs> Black is the new ugly Christmas sweater. That's all it is, Brad. Um, you know, we were talking yesterday about, you know, there's just something about the holidays and there's something about Christmas. You know, it's the end of the year. People are feeling good and... And uh, and everything's going well, but um, they there there's some traditions, and I think movies play a big part in that. And I don't know if you're a big movie watcher or not, but you know there are just certain things that for for a lot of us speak to the holidays and to Christmas. And so, uh, what to, you know, what what are your favorite Christmas? Movies. What what is a movie that Brad is like every year? He's got to sit down and watch, and uh, you know that's that's the one for him. That when he watches that movie, he knows it's a kickoff to the Christmas season. What are your What are your favorite flicks for Christmas? Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street, the original edition. That that movie is is an annual uh, event. So much so that my son one year rebelled and said, "Oh no, it's time to watch that movie again." It's um, uh, it 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 is my favorite by far. I, I gotta say, it is. I mean, that's a good movie, and I and it's not it's not on my favorites list. We've watched it a few times, uh, not on my favorite list, but definitely, you know, um, and it's always the classics. Why is it the black and whites uh, uh, that seem to? dominate a lot of the uh, uh to dominate a lot of the uh, uh, uh christmas movies brad why do you think that is well in my case it's what i grew up with oh i, mean, it's, I it's, see maybe it's because we're old that's what you're saying that's <laughs> <laughs> well in my case yeah. i'm not i'm not yeah. i'm not suggesting you michael but but in my case it's what i grew up with i you know the charlie brown specials are also uh, another oh. uh, big uh, christmas event when i hear that when i hear that uh song the charlie brown christmas song 
uh, it always uh, puts me in the spirit as well. I got to tell you, this is where we part ways. I mentioned this yesterday. Um, even as a kid, and I don't know if it's just something that's fundamentally flawed with me. I'm something wrong with me, but I do not like Charlie Brown. I have never, ever liked Charlie Brown. I don't know why. I know. I know. It's almost un-American. You know, they're going to create a new uh, new committee on un-American affairs for me just because of that right there. I simply, I simply do not like, I don't know why. I just, it's something, you know, maybe it's because I was so irritated by Lucy and the Charlie and the ball and the whole thing. I mean, maybe it was just kind of, I don't know, but it's just, it's never been a thing for me. Um, how about, um, how about white Christmas and holiday in Bing, Cros- Bing Crosby? Yeah. That's, uh, uh, D- Danny Kay was Danny Kay in that one. Yeah. Danny Kay white Christmas was Danny Kay and Bing Crosby. And then holiday in was uh, Bing Crosby and Fred Astaire. Yeah. Those, uh, those are, those are classics, uh, as well. And you know, it's a wonderful life. Uh, what you started out with is, is certainly, a. uh, on the list as well, but yeah. I, but but asking the one that I know it's Christmas, uh, that it's that it's that we've crossed the line and we're in Christmas. It's Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. There's just something about you know Chris Kringle at the end finding the cane right uh, in uh, in in the house that just uh, it just triggers me. It's just like okay, okay, that? that's it. That I'm not crying. You're crying. Um, so <laughs> right, uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm again, not... my, again, my son would say, are those tears? Is that... Yeah, really? Are you crying? Dad, what is this? It's not a Polaroid commercial. What are you doing? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, and of course, we've also got the, some of the new modern day uh, classics. Um, have you watched Elf? Have you seen Elf with Will Ferrell? You know, I never I never have. Oh, with Will. You know, I may have seen snippets of it, but it yeah. was it was why I was change, changing the channel to find to find Miracle on Thirty. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I mean, I gotta say, if you ever get a chance to watch it, not a bad flick, not a bad flick. And of course, the big question for a lot of us out here, just to test your Christmas metal, is to say, um, okay, Die Hard, a Christmas movie or not a Christmas movie? <laughs> I mean, I'm asking for oh. a friend. I'd I'd probably go for uh, I'd probably go for Christmas movie. All right, see, I mean, in in, in the same se- in the same way that Bill Murray's Scrooge is a oh, Christmas movie. Also, right? yeah, also a great Christmas movie. Great. That is actually we mentioned it. I kind of glossed over it yesterday, but uh, it is definitely uh, it is definitely one of those uh, movies that is kind of underrated. That I think you know Bill Murray does a great job uh, with. And of course, uh, we got that one. We got Die Hard. We got Scrooged, and uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, well, I, I just totally forgot what I was going to say. So it's all it's all good. So Die Hard, it's a Christmas <laughs> movie. It's good. It's uh, Brad is back on the nice list for uh, choosing uh, for choosing Die Hard as a uh, as a Christmas movie. And I think it's just any movie that brings us you know kind of together and. Helps us celebrate. Uh, helps helps us celebrate those times and uh, and just enjoy each other. Uh, somebody in the chat room, I think it was Brian, said thank you yesterday for the um, the recommendation of the Hogfather. He watched Terry Pratchett's The Hogfather, which is a um, Terry Pratchett disc world. It's a you know, and the BBC did a bunch of short series about Terry Pratchett's different things, and they did one that's a Christmas analogy called The Hogfather. Um, which is, um, it's just fun. It's just absolutely fun. So, uh, anyway, if you get a chance to watch that, that's also worth the, uh, worth well, the time. I'll, 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 I'll have to knock that, uh, uh, notch that down. I haven't seen that before. Yeah, no, I haven't, yeah, I, I haven't even heard of it before. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, and it's got a lot of great actors in it and, uh, it's just, it's just a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, and any, anybody who's done the whole Terry Pratchett disc world thing, uh, that the BBC had put together. It's a, it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's, it's great stuff. Um, all right, Brad, well, let's move on from top, uh, holiday movies to, uh, number two, which is, uh, you know, top holiday memories, traditions, Uh-oh. things that I know, I mean, Brad's like, Oh no, now I got to talk about myself and all that. I, I just, you know, it's fun, Brad, come on. I've shared all my stuff, favorite <laughs> holiday. Th- I mean, what, what, what are some of your favorite things? I mean, and recipes and things that are traditionals, you know, d- dinners or things for you that really put you 
you know, in the mood for the, uh, for the Christmas spirit. Favorite holiday memory has got to be any Christmas at my mother's house. Uh, it's, uh, or my parents' house when my father was still alive. And then, uh, now my mother's house, it's got to be any Christmas, uh, at my mother's house. It's just something about, uh, being back together with family. I, I moved to, I moved to college when I was 17. I've never really lived at home again. Um, uh, since that time, I'd go back for summers when I was in college, but, uh, I've never really been home again. Um, and so going back, uh, uh, to my mother's house, even if we celebrate, uh, Christmas in July, uh, uh, that is, that, that's the, that's the favorite memory. Uh, my mother is a special person. Uh, she makes, uh, uh, wonderful food. She just had her 89th birthday and, oh, uh, man. uh, and uh, uh, I went to had have, saw her earlier this month, and uh, it's just it's just a, a wonderful time with her. So, any uh, favorite holiday memory, favorite favorite Christmas memory is any <coughs> excuse me, any Christmas uh, uh, at her house celebrating with her. Did you uh, did you get a chance to celebrate a little Christmas early with her since you were there for the beginning of the month? We did, uh, and we had a, a great time. A, a great time with her. She's uh, she 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 lives uh, still on her own. Right. Uh, she she is uh, she she's one strong willed lady. I mean, she's had a couple of spills over the years, and uh, uh, a little hospitalization, and a little uh, surgery, and a little uh, you know fell from the steps when she uh, from a from a platform when she shouldn't have been up there uh, but she comes back she's still on still ticking she you know insists on living in her li- insists on living by herself she just got her driver's license renewed uh, and is uh, and is celebrating that so at 89 just got her driver's license renewed look out neighborhood here we go <laughs> well she uh I, she she's just an amazing lady and um uh any any Christmas, any holiday uh, that I've spent with her is uh, is is one that uh, is stored in the memory banks and will come out uh, uh, from time to time. Do you have a? I know that you're a bit of a connoisseur. You like uh, you like good food. You like the finer things and everything else. Anything that uh, you know, wine smoothies. I mean, you love it all, so it's all good. Uh, any uh, anything that uh, that that speaks Christmas to your palate? I mean, uh, is it ham? Is it turkey? What is a Christmas dinner for you guys? Is it a prime rib or Chinese food? Some people, it's like all. I mean, you know, it's it, whatever it is. It's turkey. It's turkey, and that. That memory goes back to my grandmother, my mother's mother, who was a great cook. Uh, and uh, Christmases over at, uh, uh, at that we would go over to her house for uh, my grandparents' house, my grandfather also, uh, their house for uh, Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving dinner. And it would be uh, turkey and stuffing, oyster stuffing. You oyster know, I grew up in the stuffing. Midwest. Oh, we didn't, man. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't, yeah. We didn't, we didn't have live oysters. So, you know, they would, they would put canned oysters in the, in the, uh, uh, I think they were canned. God only really knows. In the uh, in the stuffing, and uh, that was that was great. And then pumpkin pie afterwards, and and then football. You know? <laughs> oh, and then football. That was your thing. Uh, the football was the thing. Uh, oyster stuffing is amazing. We actually, um, I actually had oyster stuffing the first year that we ran the holiday recipe contest. Somebody posted uh, an oyster stuffing recipe, and I'd never had it. I'd never heard of it. And, uh, you know, I'm from Alaska. We don't have a lot of oysters up here, up in the interior, in the interior of Alaska where I was living. And so it was the first time I'd ever heard of it. And we actually made regular stuffing. And my wife, at my request, made this oyster stuffing. And it was really good. I mean, it was, I mean, it's uh, it's definitely uh, a memorable flavor and uh, definitely a, a unique way to uh, celebrate uh, Thanksgiving. And, of course, pumpkin pie and everything else. Yeah. Oyster stuffing. That was, that was my, uh, it just, I mean, that just sticks in my memory. My grandmother made great oyster stuffing. And then there's one other thing that always, I, I, I guess it goes with going back to visit my mother. We have in the Midwest, I've never found it outside the Midwest, tenderloins, what we call uh, uh, fried tenderloins. They're pounded uh, uh, tenderloin uh, uh, pieces. And then you, you fry them and they're, you know, they end up being huge. And so, Going back and visiting my mother, regardless uh, of the season, but but during the holiday season, we always managed to fit in some tenderloin. So, what did they uh, do? They, had, t- 
they hammer them flat. Lines. They hammer them flat, and then they bread them, and then you fry them in a pan. Right. Right. Oh right. man. And that those those that's as I say, I've only found it uh, in uh, pork pork tenderloins. I've only found it uh, in the Midwest. But by gosh, you know, I know the. I know the five best <laughs> we can do. We can do a top three on this <laughs> top three uh, restaurants in the Midwest that have tenderloins. Yeah. Um, so that's, so, so it's Turkey for the main meal, but then once you sort of, you know, Branch run out. through all, all the leftovers, <laughs> uh, we go to tenderloin. Yeah. That's like a schnitzel. I mean, right. I mean, that's almost like a German yeah, schnitzel. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah, you smash it flat and you bread it and then you serve it and it's uh with some noodles or whatever and it's uh it's delicious. Well no 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 noodles, don't destroy this. Oh, thing. okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> whoa, whoa, purist. I, I, man, I did not mean so, to throw heresy out there on you. <laughs> so it's so it's a so it's a tenderloin and and you know you can have it however you want, but but I have it with mustard and 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 pickles, dill pickles and and onions, and you it's a sandwich, so you put it between you know, a sandwich oh, bun. And, oh, uh, okay. It's a sandwich. You had to clarify that for me. I wouldn't put, <laughs> Brad, I just want you to know, I would never put noodles on a sandwich, okay? So that's <laughs> fine. I was thinking like a mash, reg, Yeah. Nine. Nine. Mashed, mashed potatoes maybe on your sandwich, yeah. but not noodles. No, I would put, well, that's the Dickens, right? I mean, that's our post-turkey, that's our post-turkey day sandwich is the, is the stuffing that you, you put it and you flatten into a patty and you fry it crisp on both sides. And then you put turkey and cranberry sauce and mustard and Havarti on it, and you put it on a pretzel bun, <laughs> and that is it, it. And a little mashed potatoes, maybe. And sometimes I'll throw some green bean casserole on there too, just because. So, do you schedule your stomach pump at the emergency room in advance? Exactly. Or you just, or you just, I make sure that just I wait for it. I make sure that I let my pants out early in the Thanksgiving <laughs> season because otherwise, it's going to be amazing. No need for your daily Viagra if you woof down some oyster stuffing. Well, okay. I didn't know, but, you know. And then Brian says spaghetti sandwiches are actually excellent. Well, I wouldn't say that I wouldn't put noodles on any sandwich, just not on that sandwich. I was just confused for a minute by uh, by by Rick. I'm going to put on my compression underwear when this is all over just to make sure that I can fit back into my pants. This stuff is so, uh, so good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you may, we, we may need to put them on after this discussion. I mean, I'm, I'm getting hungry now. It's I know. For... I know. Terry says, and this is a brilliant idea, and I don't know why I didn't think of this, dressing in the waffle maker the next day. You could make dressing waffles and then serve your turkey on your dressing waffles as a sandwich, right? I mean, why not? It's, you know, oof, man. Uh, best restaurant in the Midwest for fried pork tenderloins is the Iowa Machine Shed. In Altoona, I don't know where that is, and I've never been there, but maybe Brad is familiar. Well, Brad, what do you say? Oh, oh! Now we're going to get into this whole Iowa, Illinois. Who has better pork? Who oh has no, better tenderloins. <laughs> Remember, no <laughs> politics, even the politics of food. Uh, is it? I mean, I is, grew up. Is it a big thing? In, oh, it's a huge thing. I grew up in far western Illinois. Uh, uh, close enough that we would go to uh, Burlington, Iowa was one of the big towns uh, that we would go to. And it was a huge thing, whether you had an, a meal in Iowa or you had a meal in Illinois. I mean, it was, at least that's how people on the Illinois side felt. I don't, people on the Iowa side might've, might've felt differently, but uh, you know, we, 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 we went to our hometown restaurants and we went to our, hometown university even though they always lost the big game and and all that sort of stuff so yep don't don't get me started on the on iowa pork versus <laughs> illinois pork <laughs> well you know what i'm willing to try anything so it doesn't matter to me iowa illinois i'll try it out for myself and just and just to be clear for all of those people uh listening to the show who may go through macomb illinois the the best uh, uh tenderloin uh, right now, in it changes from time to time. You know, over seventy years, it's sort of changed. Uh, but the best uh, tenderloin right now is the Jackson Street Pub on West Jackson in Macomb, Illinois. So, just just to be clear, right? Just write that down. Uh, right? Just write that down. The best <laughs> pork tenderloin, and you guys don't call it schnitzel; you just call it tenderloin, right? This is a regional thing. 
I had no idea what schnitzel was till I got to college. I started describing this, and somebody said, "Well, that's schnitzel." No, no, it's not. It's, no, it's not. It's tenderloin. <laughs> Shut your filthy mouth, and then they handed it to you and said, "What, Here what you are go. you using these foreign words for?" It's, a, it's an Illinois pork tenderloin. <laughs> foreigners, you're foreigners. <laughs> Oh man, uh, I gotta tell. I love the regional thing. My buddy Brendan, you remember Brendan? Brendan Berger, my producer. Oh sure. Um, you know he's from Minnesota, and uh, and he would tell me about all the crazy things that they that it was like the must eats when you go back to Minnesota. And then Tom Oaks was from uh, he was from Wisconsin, and so it was all about the cheese and the cheese heads and 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 everything else. And uh, he would bring back some of the craziest. Um, uh, sausages and stuff from Wisconsin that was just amazing. I love the regional food. I mean, I'm a food guy. Let's face it. You can't look at me and not know that I'm a food guy. Uh, but I love to try all the regional delicacies from all over the thing. Now, Kate Brenton is oh, – go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You were going to say something. Well, catfish. Catfish is another one. We don't have catfish up here. No. Um, and – and sometimes some, and you do the same thing. You bread it, you fry it. There, there's a trend here, right? There's a, there's a theme. You bread it, on. you fry it. Yeah. <laughs> Butter, you bread it, you fry it. Oreos, you bread it, you fry it. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> but uh, catfish is another regional food. And, um, and maybe, you know, since, since catfish comes from the Mississippi river, which is the dividing line between Illinois and Iowa, maybe, maybe there's not a regional divide, a state divide on right. that. Maybe, maybe we, We'll just take our catfish from the Mississippi River and not say whether it came from the Illinois side or the Iowa side. Right. I, uh, I've i only had catfish once in my life. I actually had catfish for my rehearsal dinner when we were getting married. Uh, I think it was um, the uh, uh, Ivory, not Ivory Jacks. Um, Anyway, the lodge up there in uh, the Chattanooga Lodge in uh, in Fairbanks, they had imported a bunch of catfish for they did hush puppies and catfish for a special dinner. Oh, and it was the only time I'd ever I've ever had catfish, and it was really good. I I enjoyed it, so we'll have to uh, we'll have to try that uh, uh, try that as well. Cream cheese, well, it's it's a- cream cheese cream, bread, what? cream cheese breaded and fried. Somebody said, I'm just like. Oh my God. <laughs> Just did my arteries are slamming. Again, so. again, an advanced appointment at the emergency room. <laughs> exactly. Make sure you bring your defibrillator and your own stomach pump. That's a, that's the sign on the door as you go through there. But you got to just love it. It's just part of the experience. It's part of it's part of loving all that stuff. Uh, quickly, thirty seconds. Kate Brenton, do they have a specialty? Uh, do they have a special like regional dish that you uh, love up there? Um, boy, I'm going to get in trouble on this. I, they have turkey. They have great turkey dinners up there. Great um, turkey dinners. Uh, okay. Both, and and I'm up there usually for Canadian Thanksgiving, which is different from American Thanksgiving. Right, I, right. I get I get two Thanksgivings in that way. Hey, so, no, nobody uh, could ask for anything more at that point. Brad Keithley, our guest. It is the holiday top three. We just did the top two. Uh, which was his favorite movies and his favorite holiday dishes and memories, uh, uh, which it just it led, of course, to more talk of food. You're right, Brad. I'm hungry now. Now I'm going to have to go cook a full breakfast. <laughs> this is all over. Um, all right. So the uh, Ter- Terry, Terry, yeah, Terry, wake up. Give me. I need some eggs. Hit me some bacon and eggs and, and a, a big waffle and everything else. All right, so final uh, final segment here, which is uh, Celtic music. Now, again, I did not know this about you originally, but as I got to know you more and more, I discovered that you are a huge, huge music buff. Um, one of your favorite things pre-pandemic, unfortunately, was to uh, go around and uh, experience a lot of these concerts uh, in person, small, large, medium, different size settings, of Celtic music, and you've got your top five Celtic music acts that you want to talk about. So give it to us here from top to bottom. I got about ten minutes, uh, nine minutes here, or so, and uh, hit us with uh, hit us with what you got. All right, so I picked five, and I'm going to get in trouble because you know I should have picked somebody else. <laughs> yes. So these are these are five of my favorites. I I I don't want to call these top five now. I want to call them okay. five. Of All my right, favorites. five of your favorites. So the first one is a group called Talisk from Scotland. Uh, it's a young group, uh, some young kids that, uh, uh, one plays concertina, one plays guitar, one plays uh, fiddle. Uh, and they're just an absolutely wonderful, uh, uh, new young Celtic group. The reason I have them number one is they're coming to Alaska, uh, as part of the Alaska uh, Anchorage concert association and the Fairbanks concert Se- concert association in February. Uh, they are all, they're also in Valdez on February 9th. They're in Anchorage on February 11th. 
uh, and they're in uh, Fairbanks on February 12th. And if anybody wants to hear some really good uh, uh, current uh, sort of uh, stretch the, the edge of the envelope uh, Celtic music, uh, I would go to, to Talisk uh, one of those days. I've seen them all over the place. I've traveled a lot to, uh, to, to see them. They're good friends, uh, and I highly, highly recommend them. So number one is Talisk. And you're going to you're going to go see them in both locations, right? <laughs> you're going to go to Fairbanks and to Anchorage. I know you've done that in the past. Wait, and you're like, I saw one place, and then I'm going to go to the next one. Wait a second. Why would I leave out Valdez? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I, I, I got to see them three times while they're here. <laughs> well, and and they're coming off. I mean, uh, the 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 great celebration in Scotland is not as much Christmas as it is Hogmanay, which is their celebration of New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. And Talisk is going to be one of the premier performers uh, for the Hogmanay special on BBC uh, uh, New Year's Day. I mean, they're they're recognized widely as one of the great current uh, uh, Scottish Celtic artists. So uh, they're coming here right after they do Hogmanay and right after they do a, a festival called Celtic Connections that's, that's in Glasgow uh, in late January and early February. So it's a, yeah, I've, I've seen them a lot, uh, but, and, you know, I wouldn't leave out Valdez. So All, right, I'll be... okay. All right. We move on to number two. Number two is Martin Hayes, a fiddler from, uh, from Ireland who has the sweetest, most beautiful uh, fiddle style uh, of anybody I know. It's just pure. I mean, the Irish call it a uh, uh, pure drop, uh, which means there's really very little accompaniment. He usually has a, uh, a guitarist uh, or a concertina player with him. But Martin Hayes is one of the best fiddle players I have ever come across. Um, uh, just a beautiful player. And I've got, I put links, I think, into the uh, into the chat room, of, and I'll put them in again after we finish, of all of, uh, of, all of these artists, the Spotify links, if you want to go listen to them. So um, Martin Hayes, just beautiful fiddle player. Got no, uh, it, it's, it's what's called the West Clare, East Clare, East Clare style. Uh, county in Ireland uh, that he comes from. Um, his father was a fiddle player, but Martin's just just head and shoulders above everybody else. All right, number three. Number three is 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 a group from Cape Breton. Mary Jane uh, uh, Lamond and Wendy McIsaac, longtime friends. When I when somebody asked me how I got to Cape Breton, uh, uh, I will say you know Mary Jane was the one that that brung me. I was listening to a DVD. Uh, oh gosh, back in the late 1990s, early 2000s uh, of Celtic music. And I was just sort of listening to it in the background. Uh, and then she had a cut on that. It was from a bunch of different countries, a bunch of different performers. She had a cut on that that just stopped me in my tracks. She sings in Gaelic, um, uh, Scottish Gaelic. And, um, and it's just a wonderful, she has a wonderful voice, a wonderful style. She tells the stories of the songs before uh, and after she performs, Wendy McIsaac is uh, is one of the best fiddle players uh, from uh, from Cape Breton. And Wendy and uh, and Mary Jane go out and perform. I've traveled a lot to to see them uh, to Cape Breton, to Scotland, to uh, Vancouver, Canada, to um, all all sorts of places. Oh, and they ca they came to Alaska uh, once as well. So. Uh, that's my Cape Breton pick. Um, uh, I could go on and on and on about other Cape Breton <laughs> picks, but but Mary Jane's the one that brought me. Okay, number four. Number four is Crooked Still, which is the American Celtic. Um, bluegrass is is American Celtic. Bluegrass is what happened when the Scotch and the and the Irish came into the Appalachian Hills, and the music came in and it sort of transformed uh, into uh, into bluegrass over time. Um, and it's really just American Celtic. You can listen to to tunes that uh, bluegrass uh, players uh, will play. It's the same tune that you'll hear in Cape Breton. The Scottish Heritage uh, players will play. It's the same tune you'll hear in Ireland sometimes. So it's uh, American bluegrass. And the, and the group is crooked still. They no longer uh, tour extensively together. They have reunion uh, 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 concerts every once in a while. But the best, uh, for my money, the best young uh, progressive bluegrass uh, group that there ever was out there, and uh, I still play uh, their albums every chance I get. That's not something I'd ever heard. Progressive bluegrass. That's a you know, it's, it's not something. It's progressive. Well, you progressive rock, yeah, but not progressive bluegrass. That's interesting. 
I've got the link in the in the in the chat room. Go listen to it. You'll 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 note uh, uh, it's it's sort of the young version of bluegrass. I love it. I love it. Uh, and down to the last two minutes here, your final pick for your top five uh, Celtic. Well, not top five, but your five favorite Celtic bands. <laughs> five of your favorite. five of my favorite. I'm sorry. I don't want to get you in trouble. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> All right, Ryan Young from Scotland, young fiddle player uh, in the st- in the same style as Martin Hayes, pure, just absolutely crystal clear, pure fiddle playing, uh, and it's just it's just beautiful. I I w- went to I was at uh, Celtic Connections over in Glasgow one year. I was sitting in the audience, uh, uh, and I really you know was sort of in deep in my thoughts, uh, and all of a sudden this this beautiful music. Uh, comes through, get, penetrates my brain, and I look up, uh, and it's a kid by the name of Ryan Young. And Ryan Young has just fascinated me ever since. He's only got one album. He's working on his second. But if you want to hear some beautiful, beautiful, beautiful fiddle music, uh, uh, go listen to, to, to Ryan Young from Scotland. Now I'm going to have to go back and listen to uh, all your uh, all your Spotify links there, Brad. You were kind enough to provide us with the Spotify links, which I think is kind of cool. Give people the opportunity to uh, check these out for themselves and uh, and enjoy what's going on. Yeah, and the and and the one that always stuns people when I talk about it as Celtic is the is Crooked Still and the American Bluegrass. I mean, people. I, I grew the the way I got into Celtic music is I grew up. Uh, spending a lot of time in my grandparents' house, they always had bluegrass, uh, old-time country music uh, on the radio, and that just sort of penetrated me somehow. And when I, you know, when I was a teenager, and when I was in my twenties and thirties, I sort of rebelled against it, uh, of course, uh, as one does. But when I hit my forties and and my fifties, it just sort of started coming back to me. And so I got, as I do, I d- started digging into things. And realize that American bluegrass is just Celtic is American Celtic. I mean, it comes from the Scotch Irish who came into Appalachian, Appalachia, and um, and so I started going backwards. That's how I got into Celtic music. And it's just, I mean, you can see that one of the shows I go to uh, annually always sets aside a performance of us of an artist from Scotland, an artist from Ireland, and an artist from America, a bluegrass artist from America, playing the same tune. And you can hear the differences, the Scottish style, the Irish style, uh, the American style, the American bluegrass style. But, you know, people, when I when I talk about bluegrass as being a, a branch of Celtic music, uh, I usually get, uh, uh, you know, uh, people's mouths drop open. Right. They just don't think of it. That the way. eye roll, the head scratch, but everything has an origin. And that's uh, that's where it comes from. Uh, and as you said, it makes sense when you break it down and realize that that's where a lot of the Scotch and Irish ended up at was in the Appalachian mountain, uh, mountains. And of course, and it brought their music with them. And it, of course, it developed over the years. But that's I mean, isn't that how we're all shaped and formed? I mean, you were you know, you were raised in your parents house hearing that I was raised um, in my uh, in my parents house. But also I spent a lot of time with my grandparents who were very big into um uh, big band and swing. And so as mm. even easy, even mm. as a teenager, I loved, you know, uh, uh, the, the Dorsey brothers, Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey and, uh, you know, <clears throat> Glenn Miller and, uh, Benny Goodman. And, you know, the, the, all those, I recognize all those uh, songs and still love them to this day. Um, of course my musical tastes have changed and morphed and I have probably one of the most eclectic music, uh, tastes that, of, of anybody, you know, from everything from, lo-fi dubstep to uh to uh to big band and everything in between but i mean it's just one of those things that i just i just happen to love and uh you know one day i'll be listening to cab calloway uh swinging the the hep jive and then the next uh, day i'll be listening to emancipator or somebody doing some real lo-fi stuff you know some lo-fi uh uh music so it's an interesting um it's interesting but music moves us in so many ways it, it is. And, and, it, and, you know, your story is the same as mine grandparents house. Right. And always having the radio on, there was always music in the house that, and the, and the, you know, commodity markets, you know, the price of corn, the price of soybeans, <laughs> or the price of hogs, um, because you got to make tenderloin out of hogs, but it, but you know, it, there's, it, it just, it sort of goes in your brain. And of course you rebel against that. And of course you say, Oh, I'm never going to listen to that stuff again. But it just comes out. I mean, you know, for when you hit your 40s or your 50s or your 60s, that's what's in your soul. Um, so, yeah. 
It's a nostalgia. Lo-fi, lo-fi what? It's called lo-fi, and it's uh, it's it's very um, um, the fact that the, the the artist that I just mentioned, his name is is Emancipator, uh, is the name of his band, but he is a classically trained violinist, and uh, he uh, he plays it's a uh, it's lo-fi electronic, and so it uses fiddles and drums and everything else, but it's. Uh, it's it's super good. It's super good. Uh, you have to look him up on uh, look him up on Spotify. Emancipator, and especially his um, <clears throat> some of his early albums, he uses a lot of fiddle, and it's really good in the background. Just I use it to work all the time and stuff like that. But yeah, it's uh, my 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 top picks on Spotify this year. Jesse Cook, the the the, G- the Gypsy guitarist. He was, I was, I'm in his like 0.05 top 0.5% of all listeners in the world of Jesse Cook. I love him. Um, and he's amazing. He's a good, just a, he's amazing guitarist. And then Emancipator was my second. And, uh, and, uh, it, I, my, my mood for music is, what was it? It was lo-fi and chill. That's my mood. You know, Spotify does the <laughs> moods thing. And, uh, and I love that. I just, I love to listen to it in the background while I'm working and it just keeps me going. So anyway, no, it's good no, stuff. You, we, 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 we can start another podcast on, exactly. uh, on our, on our musical taste. On here, musical Mark. taste, food, music, uh, thing. I mean, it's all good stuff. All right. Well, Brad, Merry Christmas, my friend. I hope you have a good one. I appreciate you coming on as always. Michael, uh, the same to you and Terry and the family. I hope it's a great, uh, great holiday for you. I know you enjoy it. And, uh, and, uh, I look forward to seeing you relaxed on the other side. I got to tell you, I said earlier, I have never quite felt quite as beaten down and wore out as I have been this year. Maybe it's just me getting older. I don't know, but <clears throat> I think the last two years have uh, taken their toll. I plan on uh, parking my ass on a couch and watching a lot of TV and eating a lot of food and just hanging out with the family. So it uh, hopefully that re- regenerates my my brain pan. So thank you, my well, friend. Thank thank you, and I'll uh, I'll see you in January. All right, Brad Keithley, thank you so much, and Merry Christmas, my friend. Well, that's a wrap for another week's and indeed another year's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again on the weekly top three when we return next year on January 4th.